Yeah. All right. So our objectives, oh, I need to hide this a little bit. Our objectives are to discuss the various factors to consider related to endoscopy during the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I'm gonna start with a theoretical framework regarding the chain of infection. And we'll start with the infectious agent, move into the reservoir, portal of exit to the mode of transmission and the portal of entry into the susceptible host. As you know, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And um, while we talk about every link in the chain, we will also talk about how we can break that link in the chain. So let's um, learn a little bit about the infectious agent. Coronaviruses have caused disease in the past. Um, generally, we think of the coronavirus causing a common cold and not a big deal. But in um, 2003, we had our first encounter with a serious coronavirus that was SARS-CoV-1. Um, um, uh, in 2015, MERS started to show up and that was MERS-CoV. Um, and now we are dealing with SARS-CoV-2. So a little bit about SARS-CoV-2, it is a human coronavirus, like I said, a cold virus, and it's a variant of the coronavirus. It's the second coronavirus to cause severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS. It's an RNA virus. And RNA viruses can be a little tricky. Um, doesn't take much for them to change things up. Influenza is an RNA virus. And we're always chasing after that one. The other thing about this infectious agent is that it has a fatty outer, outer layer called an envelope. And it's usually spherical in shape. Um, it's called a coronavirus because when you look straight down at it, it looks like a crown. Um, so that's where it got its name from. It's round with those little nubs and it, it resembles a crown. So there's various types of infectious agents and they're listed here in the Spalding's um, classification system in or in order as far as the difficulty of killing it. Um, bacterial spores, as you know, are the hardest things to kill and generally you need to rely on sterilization to kill a bacterial spore. That's followed, um, mycobacterium are a little easier to kill and the prime candidate in that particular group of bacteria that we are concerned about that cause human, causes human disease is mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, and underneath that is the small non-lipid, non-envelope viruses such as norovirus. And we know that it takes um, disinfectant agents with a claim against the norovirus um, in order for you to kill that particular one. Rhinovirus is another cold virus and the HPV virus. Fungi are a little easier to kill such as aspergillus. Um, and then um, vegetative bacteria are easier to kill yet. And that, those are the ones that cause the majority of healthcare associated infections that we're aware of, such as staph and strep, um, Pseudomonas, um, E. coli, Enterococcus, Acinetobacter, um, big group of bacteria that we're quite familiar with. Um, if you've ever had to review a bunch of microbiology reports in a hospital setting. And the easiest ones to kill are the lipid envelope viruses, such as SARS-CoV-2, HIV, Ebola, and influenza. Now, make no mistake, just because they're easier to kill does not mean that they are not significant pathogens and cause a lot of damage, um, such as Ebola, influenza, we see about 35 to 60,000 um, deaths every year um, related to influenza. Now, it, in um, what we're dealing with today with um, SARS, that seems like a small number, but we've all know of someone who has died from influenza. So um, all of those um, organisms, viruses, even though they're easy to kill, can still be very deadly to us. And then we have this hierarchy of um, how to um, kill these germs, sterilization that kills everything, high level disinfection, with our glutaraldehydes or our OPA um, aldehydes. 
um, intermediate level um, disinfection, such as pasteurization, and then our surface disinfectants. So understanding the pathogen um, is very important. What is the dose that is required in order for it to cause disease? We really don't know what the infective dose of SARS is yet um, because it's just so nebulous. Um, we haven't really um, been able to fully understand this particular organism yet. Some, organ, um, some pathogens only need a very small dose in order to cause disease, such as norovirus. You only need 10 virons, not 10 droplets, but 10 virons viruses to cause a norovirus infection in a human. Same thing with Ebola. Only about 10 virons, 5 to 10 virons are needed in order for someone to get um, Ebola disease. Compare that to something such as salmonella, staph, where you need a bigger inoculum in order to cause disease. How does it enter the body? Do you inhale it? Is it injected or ingested? We know with SARS, for the most part, um, it's not a foodborne disease. It's something that we generally inhale or have contact with our mucous membrane. And then how virulent is it or likely to cause disease or death? Um, like I mentioned before, influenza can cause death. Staph, or, um, staph infections can cause death. But then there are other organisms, um, let's see, um, some very benign things in the environment that generally don't cause death unless um, you are an immunocompromised host, such as aspergillus. Um, you go walking through the woods, you're probably dealing with aspergillus on a fairly large basis, but if you're healthy, it doesn't really cause you any problems. So understanding the pathogen is so very important. I consider that chain of infection like a murder mystery. And if you understand the suspect, it, it gives you uh, more power to prevent it from causing any damage. So where does it like to live? Coronaviruses are a large family of viruses that are common in humans. Primarily, it is human to human spread. We can talk about where did this SARS virus come from all day was it bats? Was it some strange little animal in the Chinese wet market? It doesn't really matter because what is triggering the spread of this disease is human, human to transmission. This little creature that I have here on my side is a civet. And we believe that is the, the animal that caused the SARS outbreak in 2003. We know that camels are implicated with the MERS outbreak. Um, generally people who have um, acquired MERS um, initially, the, the primary cases are those that were traveling through Saudi Arabia on a camel and had to rely on camel milk or close contact with the camel in order to transverse across the desert. Chickens, outbreaks of um, coronaviruses have occurred in chickens. It can walk, um, wipe out a whole flock of chickens. They even have a vaccine. Um, for coronavirus that they give to chickens in order to prevent that from happening. And they've had that vaccine for a long period of time. Um, so sometimes you're able to develop a, um, a vaccine against the coronavirus. And luckily we, we've been able to develop one um, for our current outbreak of um, coronavirus. Portal of exit, how does it leave the body? Primarily, um, um, COVID-19 is spread by droplets, large droplets, those that travel within one, two, maybe five feet away from the individual. That does not mean that it's not possible for you to acquire this infection through airborne spread. It is very possible. It all depends upon what is that loading dose in the air. As you can see in this diagram, for the most part, this individual is spewing out droplets, large droplets, small droplets, and they're not traveling any more than five feet away. But in there are some small droplet nuclei that stay suspended in the air. Now, if you're in a crowded room with poor ventilation, with dry air, these little droplet nuclei are going to dry out and stay suspended in the air for a period of time. And that's what leads to airborne transmission. So you can be 50 um, to 160 feet away from the individual. And if the ventilation is poor and you have a large loading dose of this virus in the room, um, you could be exposed. 
there's also another portal of exit. With the first SARS outbreak, this was very significant. Um, we believe that some outbreaks were primarily due to spread through toilets, sewer system, feces, um, but we're not too sure what um, the degree of spread is with this particular COVID-19 virus. Um, we think it's less. Um, we can culture or um, detect this virus in a lot of um, surfaces in a patient's room, primarily around the toilet and in the restroom, um, to the air handling return ducts. But we're not seeing this being a primary mode of transmission um, we believe that the primary um, portal of exit is through droplets and aerosols or the airborne route, and then perhaps fecal contamination. So this is how um, you can think of the droplet nuclei. You have this virus suspended in these droplets and you have some very large ones that don't travel very far. And then you have some very small ones. And humidity plays a role in the transmission of this disease. Um, we want to see humidity levels um, in a building between 30 to 50 and 60 percent because if you have humidity in the air, that keeps those droplets large so they don't um, become suspended in the air and be airborne. So um, think about the ventilation if you're in your home. If you have a wood stove and you're dealing with dry heat all the time, you're going to be more prone to transmission than if you were, say, in the swimming pool. Um, indoor swimming pool where there's a lot of humidity going on and um, you can just kind of feel the humidity in the air. Those droplets aren't going to travel very far in an um, environment like that. So as I mentioned, the mode of transmission is airborne, primarily droplet, and then followed maybe by contact, direct and indirect contact. So I, I'm not going to say that it doesn't matter um, if we don't keep our environment clean. It does. Um, there is a role for that but our focus primarily is on the prevention of droplet spread. And we use transmission-based precautions to prevent that um, particular virus from being transmitted. So CDC um, has two models here, and um, the preferred is to use an N95 um, respirator or a PAPR. Um, that would provide you the best protection from um, this disease. Um, in the chance that you could have airborne spread, along with a face shield, goggles, something to protect your eyes, because we know it can be transmitted through mucous membranes, a pair of gloves, and a gown. If you don't have enough um, respiratory protection, meaning an N95 or a PAPR, an acceptable alternative, especially if you don't have any aerosol generating procedures going on, would be a face mask. Um, face shield, gloves, and a gown. How does it enter the body? Well, it enters the respiratory tract. That includes the nose, the mouth, and possibly the eyes. That's why we have this campaign in the hospitals where we want to have your nose and mouth covered. And if you're having any patient contact, we want to see your eyes covered also. Um, also be more cognizant about touching your face. Don't touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. And a little bit about the susceptible host. COVID-19 tends to hit those individuals with comorbid conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, cancer, um, the obese, um, uh, those that are diabetic, um, vascular problems, um, those that don't exercise diet, who smoke, um, we saw a fair number of, uh, we're reporting a fair number of individuals who smoke currently, but or who have a history of smoking and they have damaged their lungs. Alcohol intake, not sure if it's specifically rated, related to the host or um, frequently, frequency in bars where you may have that poor ventilation and people are not keeping their masks on because they're drinking. And then do you have any immunity to it? Those who had a COVID-19 infection recently uh, may have some immunity for a period of time. And then those that are will be vaccinated will have some immunity and they'll be less susceptible to the disease. And that completes our chain of infection. 
Think about the infectious agent, where it likes to live, the portal of exit. How is it transmitted? How does it enter the body? And the susceptible host. Anything we can do to change just one link in the chain will help protect you from infection. OSHA, as you know, it has its hierarchy of controls. So how can we protect ourselves from COVID-19 using that hierarchy? Well, if we can physically remove the hazard of COVID-19 through a vaccine or a cure, um, we are lucky that something like that is just around the corner. Replace the hazard, adopt new processes like working from home, not being in close proximity to other individuals, um, restricting access into your home, into your office space, into your building, such as the hospital. Isolate people from the hazard through engineering controls, uh, such as plexiglass dividers, markings on the floor. Change the way that people work, um, having um, staggered lunch breaks. Um, how are you facing people in a room? Are they facing all one direction, like in a classroom setting? Or do you see people facing one another across a table? Um, setting up administrative controls like that to guide individuals to protect themselves. And then at the bottom of that, the one that is probably the least effective um, relies on human factors, and that is the use of PPE. Um, if used consistently, these are very effective. But as you know, when you walk through the grocery store, without fail, you will see someone with a mask below their nose. Um, and unless you are directing them to keep it up on their, no on their nose, it is not doing any good. Um, not walking through the hallway with dirty gloves, keeping their face shields on, even though it's causing them to have headaches and they're heavy and you, it's causing visual distortions. Um, PPE is the most difficult thing for compliance. It's a lot easier to think of things at the top of this pyramid than at the bottom of the pyramid. So here's some additional um, controls that was published in the Archives of Bone and Joint um, in April of this year. Isolation of the sym um, symptomatic individuals, proper ventilation, barriers, and use of disposable tools and instruments would fall under engineering controls. Administrative controls includes preventing the entry of sick workers. Um, I don't know about you, but at our particular institution, we have to check ourselves for symptoms and report those to employee health every day that we report to duty. Continuous training of staff on hygiene, reducing staff hours, continuous cleaning and disinfection, and restricting staff gatherings. Um, we have restricted the number of individuals that can be in conference rooms. And then, as I mentioned before, personal protective equipment, proper use of masks and respirators, eye protection gloves, and special clothing. So now let's talk a little bit more specifically about um, endoscopes. What I did was just go through the literature. I did a lit review and pulled out articles that um, I could find related to endoscopy and COVID-19 and took some key facts um, out of these um, um, articles that I have been able to find. Now keep in mind that, you know, although this virus started back in December, um, most articles weren't really published until March. So we really don't have a lot of information out there on this particular um, virus as it relates to endoscopy at this time. One of the first articles that was published um, took place um, regarding the beginning of the outbreak in March in Spain, um, in Barcelona, where there's over 400,000 citizens. And um, this particular author reported that out of one out of their two bronchoscopists um, got infected with SARS-CoV-2 and developed COVID-19. And as a consequence, they had to bring in another person to help um, with doing bronchoscopies the third week of the outbreak. Um, they also um, published in their article pictures of what they were seeing um, of the individuals that had COVID-19 infection. And what's interesting about this is that um, they were finding white gelatinous secretions that would cling to the scope. Um, and underneath the, um, those secretions, they would see very red um, bronchial mucosal. And you can see how gelatinous and how thick um, these secretions are. And 
this to me points out the value of doing pre-cleaning, taking that scope out of someone's bronchi bronchios, bronchioles and um, having all those secretions left on there would be very difficult um, to clean once they have dried on. And that would set up um, the, the scenario of um, you not doing an, an effective job of cleaning and um, leaving some of that virus on the scope. They also pointed out that a fair number of these patients, um, these are the ones that had COVID-19, also had bacterial infections. About 30% of those individuals also had bacterial infections. Um, compared that to 41% of those before COVID-19 that had required bronchoscopies and the wide variety of organisms that they found um, with those particular patients. But what's interesting about this is a fair number of these organisms, this particular study didn't report um, stenotrophomonas um, with the um, COVID-19 patients, but some of these organisms that are being reported are very resistant organisms, such as stenotrophomonas, uh, which makes it very difficult to treat. Um, this particular article um, reported on person-to-person -person transmission of COVID-19 um, in the healthcare setting, and they found a 1% rate um, of um, suspected and 0.12% uh, of confirmed COVID-19 infection after endoscopic procedures. Um, they found that 4 to 6% of the scopes were contaminated. And this is a study out of California. It's not another country. This is one from California. And they also um, advise that staff should be wearing N95s uh, when reprocessing endoscopes. Here is another study that um, was um, a thoughtful article about should we be considering using single use flexible bronchoscopes and is that the future of bronchoscopy? Um, we're seeing more and more of a push towards single use bronchoscopes or sterilization of bronchoscopes. And we know that's gonna be the standard in the near future is sterilization of bronchoscopes. And if that is our future, would single use be more cost effective? So this particular article um, considered the various factors um, when you're doing your cost analysis. Um, ease of mobility, um, think about your bronchoscopes that you need in ICU in a short notice. Um, wouldn't it just be easier if you had a single use bronchoscope up there, um, a, a procedure that's going to be done at three in the morning because the patient has a mucus plug. Wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to worry about getting that scope down to your department and processing it or having to soak it for an hour before you process it because um, you didn't have anyone in central service at that time. Um, so, you know, the ease of mobility, especially during emergent procedures. Practicality, um, how often do scopes need to be done off hours? Um, and at the end of the day, when staff are required to stay and you're dealing with time and a half, your weekend um, bronchoscopies, and then um, your e-bus procedures. Um, wouldn't it be easier if you just had a, a disposable bronchoscope for those? And then you've got your immunocompromised patients. You know, we talked about what is the risk of these being contaminated? Doesn't take much for an immunocompromised patient to develop an infection. And God forbid, if you did a, a procedure on a patient that had a prion disease, um, those scopes would be impossible to effectively clean and you would end up needing to probably pitch a reusable scope. Other applications would be um, if you have a research lab or during bronchoscopy training. So are they cost effective? Um, this particular article also looked at um, four articles and um, kind of summarized their findings. And at the conclusion of this first article, um, at a procedure frequency of up to 200 fiber optic intubations a year, it was more useful to use a single use um, fiber optic bronchoscope or a flexible bronchoscope than to use a reusable one. And if you think about the training that needs to be done, um, how much time do you spend on that? And how long does it take to process the scope? Um, 
if you're limited to 200 of them a year, that makes perfect sense. Um, also, when you look at the risk of infection, here's one study that found that um, the infection risk to the patient is 2.8%. 3% of those patients are at risk of developing an infection because they had a contaminated bronchoscope used on them. And it's not easy to treat those infections. And as I mentioned, a fair number of those bronchoscopes were used on patients with resistant organisms. Um, here's another one that looked at the cost and um, depending upon the procedures and uh, interventions needed during the year, it may be cost effective. And another one that really could not draw any conclusion, um, but looking at everything that needed to be done to effectively process the scope, it is something that could be a consideration. Um, here is an article, and they um, concluded that a single-use bronchoscope um, was an effective tool to use. Um, the clinicians found that they actually had better volume yields um, and potentially less post-procedure side effects, such as thoracic chest pain and a cough. Um, and perhaps a single-use device, considering the risk of cross-infection, um, would be prudent. Here's another article um, that was published in Anesthesia this year. And this was looking at over 2,000 patients undergoing approximately over 3,000 various procedures. And um, this was the article that an infection rate of 2.8%. And um, this study was done in Belgium. And they found that um, use of uh, reusable bronchoscope was actually more expensive when you factored in the infection rate, about 50% more infection or more costly, um, more costly, 50% more costly um, due to the fact that 3% of these patients developed infections that were difficult to treat. And they also found that the risk for um, contamination with their scopes was 15% of them were contaminated. AGIC um, recently um, published an article, and that's my professional journal. Um, this article came from Wuhan, the epicenter, and um, it walked through um, what should be done from an infection control perspective. And I thought it was kind of amazing that um, because they had in their facility that they moved um, their endoscopy closer to the window um, and um, to, to improve their ventilation. Um, they talked about disinfecting surfaces with bleach water um, and allowing the surfaces to have contact with that bleach solution for about 30 minutes. They also talked about the importance of pre-screening before doing an endoscopy procedure. And many facilities are doing that now. They're screening their patients before doing an endoscopy procedure. Um, screening to see if they have symptoms consistent with COVID, um, testing if it's a high-risk procedure or all for, before all procedures, asking the individual to quarantine themselves before they have the procedure, so not going shopping, not having contact with other individuals from outside of your household, um, to try to keep yourself as true to your, those test results as possible if you were tested a few days beforehand. Um, and then um, were, did, were you previously infected with COVID? How long ago? <clears throat> um, they also talked about the importance of using proper PPE. They recognized that retching and coughing during an upper endoscopy procedure can generate aerosols. Um, patients undergoing colonoscopies um, may pass flatus and contaminate the surroundings. Um, our recent study in the GI lab found microbes on face shields affixed to the wall, six feet away from the patient. Um, so there may be some fine spraying going on as a result of those procedures. They also advocated for universal facial protection. And aggressive suctioning and multiple catheter exchanges also um, increases exposure risk to the staff because of splashes of secretions. Um, so this is their um, flow of events um, as it relates to a patient re um, having an endoscopy procedure. And as you can see, um, testing the patient before the procedure, um, 
it, it is one of their first steps, setting up the appointment and then doing a screening um, temperature check uh, before they um, enter the endoscopy area. Um, if they do have a fever, they refer, refer them to the fever clinic. Remember, this is China, so they are very um, aggressive about isolating patients. Um, checking the results of um, their PCR tests, um, asking them for any screening, um, screening them for any symptoms, and if everything is normal, um, doing another temperature check, um, verifying their lab results, and then the patient was allowed to enter the endoscopy area. And following the procedure, they left um, through a different route. And they followed up on their patients for 14 days after the procedure. <clears throat> um, here is another article. Um, again, this one is out of Australia and Hong Kong. Um, so this is a, a, a guidance document. And they stratified um, the endoscopy procedures into three categories. Colonoscopies, they put into a non-high risk group for the most part um, and recommended that surgical masks. And, but if you've got N95s, wear an N95 and water resistant gowns. For the high risk group, they recommended, um, and they included in that high risk group, upper GI endoscopy the use of an N95 or PAPR and water resistant gowns. The highest group are those that were suspected or confirmed to have COVID-19. And they advocated that N95s or PAPR, Amy level three gowns and a negative pressure room should be used. Um, they also um, had a picture in that article as far as how the healthcare workers should be looking um, for those high-risk procedures. You can see she's got an impervious gown on, a face shield, an N95 respirator, and nitro gloves that are covering the cuff on her gown. Um, they also advocated that N95 should be used for reprocessing endoscopes. So what's wrong with this picture? Anyone? It's not wearing any uh, any kind of gown that covers yeah. his arms. And his scope is covering his arms? Yeah. Anything else? <clears throat> Doesn't look like this individual has um, much respiratory protection on and not wearing any gowns either. So. Um, I, I just shuddered when I saw that, considering what's going on in our world today. So some of you are very familiar with Corey Ofsted. Um, she's out of the Minneapolis area. Um, she's been studying scopes for the last several years. And she found that human proteins were detected on the working channel of 100% of the bronchoscopes post high level disinfection. And that's in Minneapolis. This isn't in China or Hong Kong or some country where we think that they may have substandard infection control practices. This is in our own backyard. Despite high level disinfection, the ATP levels uh, were significantly higher on the surfaces of bronchoscopes following reprocessing. More astonishing is that even after reprocessing, approximately 60% of the bronchoscopes harbored pathogens. Um, she followed bronchoscopes in three settings, and two out of the three settings were <laughs> substandard across the board. And the one that she thought was stellar um, still did not have 100% compliance. They were not visually inspecting um, the scope, and pre-cleaning was not being done at the bedside. And let's at least pre-cleaning was being done in this institution, although they weren't doing anything else very well. So common sense indicates that irregularities in reprocessing add to the risk of this serious consequence, which is substantially ignored by the pulmonary community. And we all know that ECRI institutes have put bronchoscopes and endoscopes at the top of their list of health 
um, hazards um, since 2010. So 10 years, more than 10 years later, we are still dealing with um, inadequate handling of endoscopes. Infections associated with reprocessed flexible bronchoscopes. Um, the FDA sent out a communication in 2015. They found five years ago, failure to meticulously follow manufacturing instructions for reprocessing, including lack of pre-cleaning at the point of use. Pre-cleaning typically includes surface wiping and channel flushing to prevent drying of blood, tissue, and other biologic debris. Failure to perform thorough cleaning before high-level disinfection or sterilization failure to flush or brush channels, use of expired detergents or high-level disinfectants, insufficient flushing, rinsing, or drying after high-level disinfection, continued use of devices despite integrity, maintenance, and mechanical issues. All of these things um, lead to inappropriate cleaning, and if you can't clean something, you can't disinfect it. Here's another um, um, article by Corey Ofsted, and essentially she's saying um, the same thing that, um, you know, we hadn't been doing a very good job of cleaning these bronchoscopes before COVID. Now we have COVID and um, patients with COVID infections also have bacterial and fungal co-infections um, with these organisms that may be very difficult to eradicate, such as stenotrophomonas. And just increases our risk of these patients developing significant healthcare-related infections from inappropriate or inadequately reprocessed bronchoscopes. So it's kind of a wake-up call to the pulmonary community. So I took a look at the AMI standards to see, okay, we've had COVID around now for about a year. Did AMI change anything? And essentially, no, they didn't. Um, so this is the um, ST58 standard, chemical sterilization and high-level disinfection in healthcare facilities. They're recommending that you follow this. You don't need to do anything different, but you should follow this. The Amy ST91 standard, how does this relate to COVID-19? It provides guidelines for pre-cleaning, leak testing, cleaning, packaging, storage, high-level disinfection or sterilization of flexible um, endoscopes, um, bronchoscopes, flexible, high rigid operative endoscopes. They did not change anything. I went through the whole article and I could not find where we needed to do anything different because the patient has, co it was used on someone that had COVID-19. What about this standard where it talks about um, barriers that we should be using? Again, I went through the whole document they did not spell out that we needed to do anything different because of COVID-19. This standard is intended to ultimately assist end users in determining the types of protective product most appropriate for a particular task or situation. Nothing has changed about our PPE selection. Um, ASGE, SGNA, ACG, um, the, this is um, a multiple society document that came out related to COVID-19 and um, provides some practice recommendations. Question, does standard manual cleaning followed by high-level disinfection eradicate SARS-CoV-2? Recommendation, based on available evidence, um, standard manual cleaning followed by high-level disinfection should be effective at eradicating SARS-CoV-2. At this time, no changes to the reprocessing of GI endoscopes is recommended. Is there any specific new guidance to the reprocessing steps as outlined in prior guidelines um, for the SARS-CoV-2? Consider limiting the number of reprocessing staff. So again, think about your social distancing and experience. You don't want a lot of rookies and people just passing through your department. You don't want a crowded reprocessing department because you may have transmission from coworker to coworker in that environment. Um, consider limiting reprocessing to experienced staff with documented competency. Avoid a trainee, um, trainees and novices at this time. All endoscopes should undergo full standard reprocessing prior to the return 
um, to the endoscope manufacturer for maintenance as per usual practice. Nothing different there. What changes are needed to prevent transmission from patients um, to the reprocessing staff? Pre-cleaning should be done and commence in the procedure room per protocol. Reprocessing staff should be done in personal protective equipment that includes gloves, gown, face shield, and mask. While there is no data support or requirement for the use of a N95 respirators in the reprocessing room, their use should be considered if available. Place endoscopes in a fully enclosed and labeled container for transportation to the decontamination room per institutional policy. Again, really nothing new. Um, if you have N95s, um, you could consider using them, but they're not really saying you need to. Is there any special handling of endoscopes for known COVID-19 cases? There is no evidence that any special handling of those endoscopes used for known COVID-19 positive patients is required at this time. In essence, transmission of viral infections during endoscopy is exceedingly rare, and when it does occur, it is the result of noncompliance or deviation from required steps of reprocessing. It would be prudent at this time for endoscopy unit leadership to reemphasize the importance of optimal reprocessing and ensure competency assessments are up to date. So um, that pretty much concludes my discussion related to reprocessing, but I wanted to get a word in about the COVID-19 um, vaccine that is on our doorstep. If you have an opportunity to be vaccinated, please do so. That is going to be our best means of stopping this madness of the pandemic and to get everyone on board with antibodies, sustained antibodies. Even if you had a COVID-19 infection in the past, it is possible that you could get COVID-19 again. And we see this with chickenpox. Um, young children who um, develop chickenpox at a young age when they still have their mother's antibodies on board develop a very mild case of chickenpox. And we see time and time again that when they get older, and if they're exposed to chickenpox, they will have a robust case of chickenpox because they didn't have a very robust antibody response from having the disease. And we suspect that this may be happening with COVID-19. You may have some antibody protection for a short period of time, but we don't know how sustained that antibody protection is going to be. So I hardly, hardly, um, heartily uh, encourage you to consider being vaccinated against um, this particular disease. And that concludes my presentation and I am willing um, to take any questions. I don't see anybody with any questions right now, Marilyn. You did a fantastic job. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My pleasure. I really enjoyed doing this deep dive. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. You have a great evening. You too. Bye. Goodbye.